to Real Democracy Now. I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. My guest today is Helene Landmore, an Associate Professor of Political Science at Yale University. Her research interests encompass democratic theory, theories of justice, enlightenment thinkers and the philosophy of social science. Helene's book, Democratic Reason, Politics, Collective Intelligence and the Rule of Many, which was published in 2013, won the 2015 D David and Elaine Spitz Prize for the best book in liberal and or democratic theory, published in the preceding two years. This book was based on her PhD research in which she demonstrated that decisions taken by the many are more likely to be right than decisions taken by the few. I've asked Helene to join us today in season one to explain what her research tells us about how and why deliberative mini-publics work. Welcome and thanks for joining me for season one of Real Democracy Now! Can We Do Democracy Differently? a podcast. Thanks, Helene. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into your book, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be working in the area of democratic innovations? Sure. So my current work is a natural follow-up of my previous book that you just uh, introduced, Democratic Reason. Uh, in that book, I mostly relied on mathematical theorems and, and a rather abstract formal model of what democracy is to make the case for its superior ability to um, track the truth, get to the right answers, um, aggregate knowledge. So that was sort of the main argument, the argument from collective intelligence for the superior wisdom of the many, if you will. And there are many ways in which this argument could have been made and, and others, other people have, have made it from a, from a more historical angle, for example, like people like Josia Ober, who studied uh, ancient Greece and, and tried to demonstrate that ancient Greece, had, um, ancient Athens was, um, you know, more, more efficient, smarter in many ways than, than uh, uh, city-states like, like Sparta. And my approach was much more general and so much more abstract, which has its strengths, but also its limitations. So... In this new project, I was interested in switching gear, if you will, and, and getting closer to the ground and looking at um, what people are actually doing in the real world to make democracy more democratic, smarter. Um, and, and so I came across this literature on democratic innovation that uh, really interested me. Um, so it was a, a deliberate decision to, um, to sort of uh, change the, the sort of uh, methodology of my, of my research start from the ground up instead of deducting, you know, conclusions from, from abstract principles. There was also um, a sort of another factor that led me to, this, to the study of this democratic innovation, which is that in 2012, I happened to go to a conference in Iceland. And I don't know how much you know about Iceland and what, what's been happening here for the last few years, but they've really been incredibly, incredibly innovative in the way they've tried to um, include people in their political uh, decision making and particularly the, the constitutional um, process that took place between 2010 and 2013. So they used um, a randomly selected assembly to brainstorm the values they wanted to see embedded in a new constitution, for example. That was a huge innovation. And so because I was there when, when things were uh, already happening, I got drawn into the, the, the study of that, of that uh, process. And so that's also um, where I developed my, my taste for this sort of, a, you know, um, uh, experiments. And, and then when I, was in, um, when I was at Stanford in 2013 for a year, I met um, a colleague from Finland, Tanya Itamurto, who was uh, then working on, on designing a crowdsourcing uh, policy reform process to, to reform the way uh, snowmobiles are being regulated in, in the northern part of Finland. And so she brought me on board, and so for, uh, for about a year, we, we worked together on designing that process, and I went to Finland, and we gave our results to Parliament, so I became an actual um, uh, practitioner, if you will, of, of uh, the more abstract ideas I'd been toying with for a year, so it's been very exciting so far. It does sound very exciting. How did you come to be in Iceland at the time all of that was happening? Well, you know, it's, it's the serendipity of uh, academic conferences. I was invited because of my abstract views about democracy. And 
they wanted me to 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 just um, give a sort of epistemic analysis of what the constitutional process uh, you know was or, or its quality, if you will, and and so I did that, and then and then I got drawn into the 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 you know the, the cogs and wheels of the whole thing. I, I was I was just interested in um, you know in talking to people and meeting the actual um, the the actors that that uh, were a part of this. So I met um, most of the members of the constitutional council at this point, and including Bjork's father. Cause that's also the exciting thing about about <laughs> Iceland. It's false who you get to meet celebrity, cele- local celebrities um, all the time. Um, so yeah, that that's that's just uh, luck, I guess, in, in a way. So your book focused on um, what you said you called collective intelligence as an argument for democracy. Can you tell us a bit more about your research um, there into decision making by groups and how this relates to deliberative mini publics? Right. So, so I need to um, go back to my previous work then. So the the, the idea was that um, the, the first book, Democratic Reason, was an attempt at showing that um, uh, democracy is better than less inclusive regimes at tapping the collective wisdom of its people, right? Um, and so I wanted to show that inclusiveness, and specifically inclusive, inclusiveness on an egalitarian basis, produces smarter outcome. And to, to make that claim, I relied on, on a, in part, because there are many, many uh, reasons, many, many uh, results that I use, but I relied a lot on a, on a result by um, Scott Page and Lu Hong, um, who are two um, American academics, who showed that when it comes to problem solving, randomly selected groups um, can outsmart um, groups made up of, the, of, of experts, if you will, um, because they contain more cognitive diversity. And co- cognitive diversity turns out to be an ingredient of collective intelligence that is more important than... Um, individual competence. So cognitive diversity is basically the set of mental tools you bring to bear on, on an issue. So, you know, we all, we're all born with different types of intelligences. We all go through different life experiences that shape how we approach a problem. So some people are more analytical, some people um, have more of an emotional approach to issues, or, you know, some people see the world through numbers, some people see the world through words. Some people have a sort of a democratic uh, sensibility. Some people have a more conservative, you know, Republican sensitivity. All these things actually shape the way we solve problems. And it turns out that at, at the group level, um, you get more out of a group that contains a, a diversity of, of these mental cognitive tools, if you will, than from a group of people who are very smart individually, but tend to think the same, perhaps because they went to the same school um, perhaps because they were trained in, in exactly the same discipline. Um, so, so in a way, that, 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 that sort of opened a new sort of a, a set of insights for me. I thought, oh, wow, maybe that's why, you know, um, our democracies are, are uh, you know, dysfunctional today. Maybe we don't have enough cognitive diversity at the, at the uh, decision level. Um, but more generally, maybe that's why still overall, democracies um, should, or, and I think, outperform oligarchies, because they, they do have this sort of uh, uh, cognitive diversity at their heart that, that um, more exclusive and inegalitarian decision-making processes uh, lack. How much diversity do you think we need or to sort of get that the sort of standard um, criminal jury of 12 people perhaps doesn't do it? What, what, what did your research say about the quantity of cognitive diversity? So cognitive diversity is always relative to the question at hand, right? So if you're going to solve a, a I don't know, a, a crossword puzzle, maybe you need uh, people who are poets, maybe you need people who are mathematicians, and, you know, it's, it's all relative to the problem at hand. But the thing about politics is that you never know ahead of time what skills you're going to need. So... What you want to do, basically, is what I think politics is about, is dealing about the fundamental uncertainty um, that we humans have to, have to face um, as, as political communities. So what you want to do is to maximize your chances to have the relevant tools in the pool of decision makers at any point in time. And so, you know, you could design your, your decision making assemblies by assuming that, oh, what's important right now is that, you know, we, we, we have people who know how to deal with an economic crisis, right? And then you will, you will staff your assembly with maybe um, 
you know, PhDs in economics, um, Wall Street types, um, you know, um, historian of, you know, economic crisis. Then the problem is that, you know, they will maybe be able to provide you with, you know, extremely sophisticated answers to the crisis. But then what if the next issue on the table that they have to legislate about is, I don't know, um, poverty in, um, you know, uh, uh, in certain segments of the society or, or just um, nuclear uh, power plants uh, leakage or something like that. Well, then you won't have the kind of uh, cogn cognitive diversity you need because you will have selected along one dimension only, which was the economic dimension. So the idea is that if you have an all-purpose assembly like what we think of uh, you know, as, as a congress or a parliament, it needs to reflect the, the diversity of um, interests uh, and, and potential problems that we are going to face as a society over time. So that, that's the idea. So that's why I got drawn to mini publics because they, they are, uh, you know, um, groups of, of citizens that have been uh, generally randomly or nearly randomly selected and uh, they contain the sort of uh, the, the, the larger diversity of the group in a way that um, groups of experts usually uh, don't. And your experience in, in Iceland, and I think the other was Finland, was it? Yeah. Of real world groups, you know, um, of, with cognitive diversity. How, is that, how have you found that to um, work in practice? Um, so, so actually I found that to work very well, but I want to draw a distinction between the Icelandic case and the, and the Finnish case. So let me explain a little bit about the Icelandic case first. So the, the main innovation in the Icelandic case was that they run a constitutional process, uh, you know, with an assembly that was supposed to basically draft the text a referendum downside of the of the process um, and then parliament was supposed to um, give the final seal of approval if you will because the the, the, the referendum was not uh, binding but what they did um, at the very beginning it's a very unusual way of consulting the the, the people at large was that they designed this uh, so-called national forum of 950 randomly selected or quasi randomly selected citizens and as I said, they, they asked them for a day to brainstorm the kind of values that they wanted to see embedded in, in the process. So that, that's the part that has, um, that's the closest to a mini public in the whole experiment. That um, mini public, if you will, um, uh, put on the table a number of principles that, that were quite provocative. They, they wanted, to, they wanted um, the, the, the constitution to contain, for example, the principle of the uh, collective ownership of natural resources you know, so that mm. um, oligarchs wouldn't be able to appropriate all the, the profits from exploiting the very rich natural resources of Iceland. Uh, they wanted uh, to implement uh, strictly the principle of uh, one person, one vote, which is uh, currently not the case in Iceland because of the way the districts are, um, you know, cut out and so it gives more power to the, to the countryside at the moment. So they, they had a, um, a number of... Um, very clear recommendations for the Constitutional Assembly, later turned Constitutional Council. And I think it, it worked uh, very nicely. Um, it, it didn't have a decision power, so it's hard to measure exactly what success is in a context like that. But I think it was very well organized. Uh, people were excited about um, taking part in it. And it's certainly set a democratic precedent for any uh, constitutional process in the future. I think people are currently looking to Iceland as this laboratory for democratic experiments. And that feature of the process, I think, was one of the most innovative and, and promising. So now in, uh, in, uh, in Finland, uh, it was a very different experiment. Uh, it was a crowdsourcing experiment. So I'm reluctant to call, uh, you know, the crowds that are involved in crowdsourcing experiments mini publics per se. To me, I, I have a, perhaps a restrictive definition of what a mini public is, but it needs to involve some form of uh, random selection or quasi-random selection. That doesn't need to be perfect, but I think this is important um, to, to, for, the, for the group to claim to be like uh, a small version of the public. Mm, I agree. Right? Yes. But uh, in, in crowdsourcing experiments, you're basically opening the door and anyone who wants can show up. So it's not, there's no selection. It's, it's purely self-selection. People show up online. If they're interested, um, there are 
really, I mean, as long as they behave properly and they, they don't even have to give a, um, their name. I mean, anonymity is, uh, is uh, permitted. So it's a different kind of experiment. And, and I, don't, I, I wouldn't categorize it as, a, as an experiment in, uh, in you know, mini public design, if you will. But it had a lot of virtues too. I mean, the, the beauty of that is that you get people who are highly motivated, usually very informed. So you get a non-representative sample of the public, actually. So it's not really a mini public. It's a subsection of the public, which is usually um, highly educated, uh, quite politicized, um, usually also, um, uh, you know, uh, very male, <laughs> to be fair. So it's not a mini public, but, but these are people that are uh, willing to contribute an enormous, an enormous amount of, of, of their time and, and their knowledge. And so they, they can be put to use in a democratic system. Um, the they crowdsourcing platform, which are basically platforms where you um, invite people to come and contribute knowledge and share skills and, and uh, ideas about how to solve problems, um, are a form of democratic innovation that is very useful as well. Were you able to see a difference between you know, a, a sort of randomly selected group making decisions and a non-randomly selected group making decisions? Was there actually... Um, a clear benefit in practice from the cognitive diversity? I can't answer that question, but I can tell you the difference between a group of ordinary citizens, which is actually, you know, it's not random, so it's definitely not a mini public, but it's definitely more diverse than a group of experts. And they, they came up with um, uh, things that the expert didn't think of, uh, like a more extensive set of rights, including for the transgender community, because they crowdsourced part of their... Of their um, uh, drafts and so they got more uh, more ideas from from the outside public so that's one example another example was the right uh, to internet so um, the idea that the government should be shouldn't be allowed to um, uh, turn off the, the internet when it's convenient uh, and that came from from a Facebook post as well so you know I suspect that from that sort of limited comparison my suspicion is very strong that you would get more ideas from an even more diverse and larger group of people than the 25 ordinary citizens that I studied, if you will. The Finnish example, though, where it was self-selected, what, what's your feeling about the cognitive diversity? You've already said that it tended to be more male. Did, did yeah. you get a sense or did your research look specifically at the, the cognitive diversity uh, in that work? So there, uh, it's interesting because... Yes, the, the, you know, it's, I think, something like 80% male. So that's, that you might say, well, that's probably not going to translate into a lot of cognitive diversity. But remember, the issue was very specific. We're not talking about an all-purpose assembly. The issue was regulation of uh, off-road traffic, specifically the regulation of snowmobiles. And that's already uh, uh, an issue that's of interest mostly to the male population. I mean, typically, it's a very male activity. So it, it's not as, as big of a deal that, that uh, there was such a skew on, uh, along the, ge the gender, gender um, lines. But we still observed a, a lot of um, what I would call cognitive diversity, for example. Again, compared to what? Compared to what the experts uh, offered. So the experts were not able to uh, uh, produce a good law on, on, on that issue. That's why the government decided to try crowdsourcing. And so what we uh, observed as researchers is that very good ideas came up um, in the process of, of you know, garnering information from the crowd, and including one uh, which I thought was really, really smart. Uh, some of the uh, members of the crowd said, well, why don't we put um, t t GPS um, uh, devices uh, on all snowmobile uh, um, vehicles, and that way we track where most of the use is, uh, wh where most, most people go and where uh, roads are needed and then we would create an officialized road where they're already um, kind of being traced and being used right sort of Hayekian argument like you, you you build roads where people are already going yes and I thought it was extremely smart but then what happened is that when we asked the crowd to rank the proposal that particular proposal that I thought was so smart actually um, was ranked like one of the lowest why because at that point we had a conflict a, a conflict of values Snowmobilers are typically extremely libertarian and they don't want the government on their back. And so the idea of having a GPS device, um, you know, manda mandatorily, uh, you know, put on, the, on, their, on their snowmobile just made them crazy. They, they didn't want to be uh, monitored. They didn't want mm. to 
you know, be watched and have the government know when they were speeding or, you know, doing somewhat illegal stuff. So I guess uh, that was an interesting um, case of, yes, cognitive diversity was actually um, there and, and produced interesting results, but then it clashed with uh, the, 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 the values, right, that uh, the snowmobile community represented and, and the sort of values that the government was, was um, representing. The next thing I'd like to ask you in, about, and that is uh, your work around sortition, uh, selection of representatives by lottery more generally. And I think I've read some work you've done suggesting that that could work to um, select our democratic representatives rather than the traditional model of election. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your thinking there. Right. So so sortition is uh, the, the principle, just to clarify for your audience, potentially the principle consisting in choosing people at random as if they were balls in an urn, right? So it's really um, being as blind as you can be to gender, color, religion, ethnicity, political affiliation, charisma, ability to bribe people or speak Spanish. It's really like um, the, the most sort of a absolutely blind method um, of selecting people. And as a result, it's the ultimate equalizing mechanism. And that's why the Greeks used it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a cliche now to, to say this, but it's true that um, they thought of elections, by contrast, as an oligarchic mechanism because it allowed for all sorts of social and economic distinctions to come into play, whereas um, lotteries or random selection was a truly a democratic selection method. So one wonders why, um, you know, in the effort to democratize our existing institutions, we haven't already um, created assemblies, uh, you know, at the national level that would be randomly selected rather than elected. As I as I said before, the, the one of the virtues of sortition is that uh, it mirrors the cognitive diversity that is present in the country, and so in a way, it's more likely to tap again the collective intelligence of the of the larger group. Um, other people argue that um, you know. Random selection is also good because it uh, protects um, the the members of those um, assemblies from from corruption. They cannot be bribed because this will have no effect whatsoever on the composition of the next assembly, for example. Uh, or um, so th there are all sorts of virtues associated with uh, with random selection. Now, um, what kind of reforms should that lead us to embrace? So there are a bunch of um, of propositions out there. I don't have one specific myself, but I, I know that some people advocate uh, replacing current um, parliaments with fully randomly selected assemblies. Others say no, that's too drastic. So why don't we just create a, um, um, a third assembly? You know, along the so you, you'd have um, the the House of Representatives, the, the Senate, and then a, a third assembly composed of randomly selected members who would have um, maybe an agenda setting function. So they would be the ones coming up with uh, proposals that would then be debated in uh, the House of Representatives. Or they could have just, um, on the contrary, uh, um, a vetoing function. So they would um, be allowed to veto proposals by uh, the House of Representatives. Or they could have just a, an advising function. They would be a place where um, citizens can actually deliberate a thing that apparently, uh, an activity that apparently uh, uh, congressmen don't have time for anymore because they are too busy uh, raising funds. So it could be a, um, a place where, uh, you know, what I call democratic reason happens and, and then seeps through the rest of the system, whether because this, this house, this, this new sort of uh, assembly has an advisory role or a vetoing role or an agenda setting role, I'm not sure. So there's, there are lots of possibilities. Um, I know that in, um, in Canada, there are people um, arguing that the, the Senate should be replaced uh, by such an assembly because it's too corrupt, too dysfunctional. Um, so at this point, we should uh, let go of the vestiges of, uh, of you know, ancient aristocratic orders and replace them with, uh, with, a, with a truly democratic, lotocratic uh, assembly. So these are some of the some of the options, and they, they can come across as, as utopian or unfeasible politically uh, right now. But I, I think we we need to keep um, thinking about this and pushing the envelope. And maybe maybe one day some country will 
we'll try those things out, maybe Iceland, um, and okay. then we'll figure out that it works and, and it will uh, sort of travel to other countries. And Helene, the, uh, a lot of um, the deliberative mini publics that I'm familiar with, the selection, uh, there's, a, there's an element of stratification in the selection to ensure, I guess, that there is um, the gender equity, there is a range of age groups and so on. Is that something that would happen in sortition? The way you described it, it was it's totally blind and so it would be just totally random whether you had half men and half women or three quarters of one and a quarter of the other. Right. Well, so, um, yes, in, in my model, it, it's, you know, a true random selection where you don't stratify anything. But it's assuming that, you know, you get to have every person... Um, Included in the in the sample from which you, you you draw people, currently it's very hard to do that because uh, pe- pollers what they do they, they use um, landline num- phone numbers to call people. So the result is that they overlook um, the youth, for example, because young people use cell phones, so they they're not mm-hmm. in any uh, listing. So so in the end, because of all these limitations of, of reality, often you are forced to. Um, creates, uh, you know, subcategories from which you're going to make sure you, you get a, a sufficient number of people. So whether it's, it be age or, or ethnicity or um, religion, I'm, I'm not sure what, what would be the relevant categories, but it's true that you probably have to compensate for the, the limitations of reality by, by taking into account um, subgroups, um, sub, demographic subgroups. Gender is not really an issue, I feel, because... Um, Typically, you would get a fifty percent, uh, you know, ratio of women. Um, but minorities are an issue, especially also if you're going to go for a relatively small um, mini public. If if you're going for a, you know, hundred or two hundred people, um, you will miss uh, minorities that are too small to register at that, uh, you know, at that level. So so you need to oversample certain minorities probably to see them in your sample Mm -hmm. that to me this has you know epistemic costs as well but uh there are political reasons to want to do that so i'm not opposed to um, a tweaking of of of, of the pure uh random selection model some people uh, question how sortition would work and you've mentioned obviously um you've raised the issue of corruption and how that hopefully would be uh not an issue for a a house of a, some sort of house of government selected by lottery. One of the questions that I've heard raised is the issue of leadership. And I suppose if we've still got uh, elected houses, then that's addressed. But if we were to replace the approach of electing our representatives totally with um, selecting them by sortition, how do you see leadership would fit into that, so, that system of government? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I don't think that you would necessarily lack in leadership. I think in every group, in even randomly selected ones, you will have people who will display more leadership than others. So you will just get it, you know, uh, from unexpected people, presumably. And um, like every assembly, um, a randomly selected assembly would have to have someone play the role of chair, have a facilitator potentially, um, and and that could come from, from the group. So I don't see leadership as uh, absent from from that model i haven't given much thought to you know what that would mean um but i also think we maybe we we over we overvalue um the type a you know elected representative um as the as the model of a, of a leader i think there are very different ways to be a leader and that can um you know uh, be achieved by people who are more soft-spoken, more, more quiet, uh, you know, leading from behind. Uh, there are all these new models of leadership that are out there. And so we just have to reinvent leadership in a way to, to fit with this model. I, I don't have a specific sense, but I, my intuition is that it wouldn't be such a huge problem. And also, you have to remember, like, the idea of um, using random selection to select certain types of assemblies, it's not, abend- it doesn't mean abandoning everything we know already works. And so if you need uh, uh, 
a party leader, well, in, in a party structure, well, it, you can still have that. It's, it's, it's already part of a system that sort of works, but has a lot of flaws. So adding on this module of, of a randomly selected assembly, to me, is just complicating the system, making it more sophisticated, making it more um, responsive in many ways. So there's still room for leadership. I, I, I'm not worried. So look, I'm just wondering if you could uh, tell me what what's your view of the essence of a real democracy? So, so for me, democracy is defined by inclusiveness and equality in the decision-making process about public affairs. So it's centrally about these two principles, inclusiveness and equality. Inclusiveness, it's the idea that any member of the political community has a right to have his voice heard and his or her interests taken into account in the decision process. Second, it's the idea that it's this inclusion must be done on an egalitarian basis, everybody on equal terms. So democracy is basically a, a, a mode of decision-making where everyone has an equal chance of being heard. That's what the Greeks um, thought too. They, that's why they emphasized that when it came to public affairs, it didn't matter who you were, how old you were, how many degrees you had, you had the same rights of speech as anyone else and one vote and one vote only. So if you take these two principles as the essence of democracy and you look at contemporary democracies uh, in their light, I think it becomes clear that we're not scoring that high uh, on, the, on the continuum that leads from oligarchy, an exclusive and inegalitarian regime, to true democracy. Because ordinary citizens only get to cast a vote every four years. Their voice do not matter all that much. Um, they're suddenly not included uh, on an egalitarian basis in, uh, in, in the decision-making process at the moment. And we had this illusion that representation through election would take care of it, but we know that's not the case. I mean, there are very uh, shocking results in, in, in political science that, that just demonstrate that there's strictly a zero, there is zero correlation between the preferences of the majority and uh, public policy outcomes. That, that's the work of my colleagues, uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page. Uh, so if that's the truth, then we, we have so much work to do to fix our existing representative governments and turn them into actual democracies. Yes, and I think uh, sometimes as well as all the democratic innovations that um, you're looking at and that I'm interested in, the voting system itself can make that um, that element of equality sometimes doesn't come through just because of the design of the electoral system. Yeah, exactly. I think I think for example, gerrymandering is also a way of robbing people of their voice and and um, equal vote. I mean, it's basically elites choosing their voters as opposed to you know voters actually choosing their representatives. So, um, so look, my last question. If you could change one thing about our current system of democracy, what would it be? So I, I don't want to I don't want to change only one thing. So that's that's why I'm writing this new book about the, the necessity of a shift of padding from our current representative government, which is you know only semi democratic, mm -hmm. to post representative democracy democracy where a lot of those democratic innovations we're talking about, including many publics, would be implemented and would truly change the the nature of the relation between citizens and their representatives. If you press me, I would say that currently the most important thing to do is probably to take money out of politics. Um, I think it, um, it definitely enslaves representatives to their donors and it makes Rousseau's quip that, you know, uh, being represented is being enslaved uh, too true in a way. So I think European democracies where money does not play such a role are a bit healthier than, than the American one um, at the moment. But they all have their issues. So I think taking money out of politics is a good beginning, but it's, it's, only, um, it's only a way to take care of one problem. And there are many more. Yes. Thanks, Helene. It's been really wonderful having this conversation with you. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now!, you can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. 
I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy.